of all, um, it's it's terrific being here. And I, I, unfortunately, because I'm a, a, a fiction writer, I have to now start off with a story. Um, the story goes like this. Um, my grandfather, who was Swedish, came over to the United States via Ellis Island just about 100 years ago now. And he got off, um, he couldn't read, he couldn't write, and he wanted to take a train to go out to Minnesota, where there are a whole bunch of Swedes, and start a farm out there. Got on the wrong train, couldn't read, um, and ended up in a place called Ganado, Texas. And um, got 40 acres down there um, that were some of the crummiest acres around Ganado, filled with rocks. So I cleaned them all out by hand. Um, and so uh, he started to plant cotton. Those 40 grew into 450 acres over time. And then there was this little kid who grew up in New Jersey whose name was Lance Olson, um, who would come down every summer and sort of, you know, supervise um, the, the farm. And he was doing really good work. And, and then um, uh, I, that, that kid went down there until he was about 15 or 16. And then, um, you know, went off to college and all those things that kids do. My granddad um, retired. And now what is so surreal is the fact that here I am just a few miles south of Ganado, and, and Jeffrey and I are sort of tilling some other acreage and, and trying to make some new things grow. And all within 100 years. It, it's, it's, quite, it's quite extraordinary. So it, this, this whole sort of... UHV FC2 connection is is amazingly thrilling, and it's I'm I'm just real happy to to be a part of this. And great things are going to grow here. Um, FC2, you should know, is a very small publishing enterprise that's been going on for now about 35 years, and it started not unlike my granddad's um, farm um, with very, very few resources. I guess there were six writers who were sitting around one evening and decided they were going to create a press sort of by and for writers um, in 1974, which was two years before my granddad died. And, um, and then from then to now, we brought out over 100 writers, um, hundreds of books, and are continuing to grow. And I think this new sort of relationship with UHV is going to take us to that, that next step. So, so I'm looking for the 450 <laughs> acres at the end of this. Um, Okay, so, so let, me, let me turn to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, what I want to do is talk just a little bit, sort of raise the question um, about what a book is and what reading is, really, and um, do that by examining one area of contemporary fiction that's just been interesting me a lot lately, and, and that area is called new media writing, um, it's called hypertext, it's called hypermedia, and let me just give you a quick little history to bring you up to date with what's going on in this area, and then I, what I want to do is just to share a couple of examples, one of which I've written, uh, a couple of which other people have written there are really interesting um, um, pieces. But hypertext sounds like it's, it's a new idea. Um, the term was coined in the late 1960s by uh, a guy, a uh, theorist whose name was Theodore Nelson, but it actually has a really long history before that. Um, what hypertext really means is non-sequential writing, um, that is writing that can be read out of order, um, sort of like shuffling index cards and just picking out an index card from any place and reading it and seeing how a story forms like that. Um, it also brings into a, a, a kind of um, possibility space image and text and music and that sort of thing. But that, that primary idea of non-sequential writing goes back a long, long way. Um, one of the first examples I can think of, for instance, is biblical exegesis um, and the, the whole notion of biblical scholars sort of writing exegesis of the text in the margin so your eye would read down, then you would skip over, see what has been written, and skip back. And the Bible itself, of course, is one of the first hypertexts. Um, nobody ever, you know, reads it from, from Genesis to Revelations. And in fact, most people skip around, will read a little bit here, <coughs> skip down, read over here. Um, scholarship itself is a hypertextual endeavor. As soon as footnotes were introduced um, in, in 
the 17th, 18th century area, what you started doing was having to relearn what a page was. We usually think of a page as something that starts in the upper left, moves to the, the lower right, but actually that's, that's not the case, hasn't been for a long time in, in some fields. One of them is scholarship, where your eye always drifts down to the footnote, reads what the footnote is, drifts back up into the page, often having lost your place, and, 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 and you, keep, you keep doing that, right? Um, in 1945, the presidential science advisor, whose name is Vannevar Bush, um, suggested a new, and he wrote this article for the, for the Atlantic Monthly, and he suggested a new way of thinking he said that people don't really think in terms of logical systems, and people don't really think in terms of, of making little lists and so on. So he, he devised a system called a Memex system. It was going to be electronically um, employed, and what it was, he said, is, is a system that would get us to think as though we were dealing with little index cards, that we would, instead of thinking in logical terms, think in associative terms. Think about, oh, these, these ideas all group under the color green, so I'm going to put all those together, even though you know, one may be a tree, one may be a car, one may be a plane, whatever, um, one may be a kind of vegetable. Um, we're going to think in associative terms, and those associative terms will lead us to make new connections among these ideas, rather than just thinking the way we, we always think. Also, um, in the early 1960s, you started getting a lot of experimental literature that was essentially hypertext um, in essence, you know, um, but was still in print form. So it would be stories like Robert Hoover wrote this story, a wonderful experimental writer called The Babysitter, in which um, you can read the story out of sequence, okay, but in which um, contradictory plots happen. So sometimes the babysitter gets killed. Um, you know, sometimes she has a nice quiet bath. Sometimes her parents come home and yell at her. Um, you know, and, and so on. But there are sort of mutually exclusive paths, uh, plot paths that you could go on in this story. Um, and there are a lot of writers in the 60s and 70s that explore this sort of hypertextual space of, of narrative. Okay, um, and then uh, in the early 80s, as the personal computer came about, uh, people began to explore the idea of not only talking about it, I mean, the problem with the print page is that you still have to ultimately read from upper left to lower right, you have to read from beginning to end of a book just because it comes in a spine, you can jump around a little bit, but it's still, it's still sort of materially fixed in a certain, certain pattern. Computers open that space up and suddenly you begin to compose out of sequential order and do some fairly interesting things. You all sort of intuit this because you've all been raised, you know, on the web, or a lot of you have, and as soon as you enter the web, you've entered the monster, you know, the hypertext of all hypertext. Every time you, you hit a link, you're going somewhere else and jumping around, and, and you all know this. Anybody who surfed the web, 30 minutes later, you have no clue where you started from. You have no clue where you've been, and you have no clue where you're going. Um, but, but it seems fun, right? But 30 minutes has passed, and you have no, no way to document what happened. Um, in any case, but also uh, a lot of um, creative writers who had some tech savvy or, or you know, combined, kind of ponied up with some people who had some tech savvy began to create these, these um, hypertext things. And uh, one of the first came out in, I think it was written in 1986, was really distributed within a couple of years of that um, by a guy named Michael Joyce. Michael Joyce wrote this hypertext called Afternoon a Story. And it's this amazing story. Um, it's about this guy who's been estranged from his wife. He's driving home one day. And just out of the corner of his vision, you know, busy road, going fast, and the same speed, he sees that there's been a car accident over to the side. And there are two bodies lying on the uh, grass in a front yard. And he thinks he sees that it is his wife and his son. Um, but he can't be sure. And then the text just begins to loop back over and over again in that moment and him obsessing on that. Hypertext, if you think about it, is a form that's, that's made for obsessions because you keep returning to the same, the same point over and over again, the same spaces of, of text, these little spaces called lexia. Um, and so, so um, in the 1980s, it began to develop as, as a real art form. In the 1990s, the golden age of hypertext um, came about where a lot of young writers who really had begun to grow up on tech, but also had the, the sort of 
narrative know-how, lyrical know-how, language know-how to pull together a beautiful story, um, began to try their hand at it. Um, and what I want to do is to, to look at a hypertexture in the middle of the 1990s, um, one from just a couple of years ago, and then show you a couple ways in which it sort of branched out um, from there. So if we can go ahead and lower the screen and... <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay. Um, First of all, uh, if you're interested in this talk and you want some access to a lot of uh, free hypertext, hypermedia, um, new media writings, um, go to this page. What you can do is to Google um, Electronic Literature Collection Volume 1. You'll come up with this. Each of these squares represents um, one of the hypertext that's been selected by um, a group of, of hypertext writers as the best to come out over the last uh, 15, 18 years or so. And um, what I want to do is just to focus on one of them um, by a woman whose name is Shelley Jackson. And she wrote something in 1997 <coughs> called My Body, uh, a Wunderkammer, and um, a, a, a you know, cabinet of, of magical little spaces. And um, what she did, let me show you how, it, if you called it up actually, this is sort of an introductory page for the uh, anthology, but this is how, how it originally appeared. came with breathing, because it's my body. And, and as you go into it, um, click on this, and what you see is a drawing that she did of her body. And what she's playing with is this whole notion of the body as a text and also the text of one's body. And so what she does is to write a memoir. The, the subtitle used to be, I have no idea why she changed it. I just went back to look at it here and realized that she changed the subtitle. The subtitle didn't used to be a wonder It used to be um, a memoir in lies. And, and what she did was to try to write her memoir through remembering parts of her body and what had happened to them. Um, and so you would go down here, for instance, um, you can scroll down, and she has a part of tattoos. And so you check out the tattoo part, and you say, I have 28 tattoos, of which two are visible. On my right arm, over my triceps, I have a black ampersand, about one and a half inches high. I have a black vortex on the inside of my left ankle. I got tired of answering questions, and what, about the ta my tattoos, so I had the remaining work done in ink, the exact color of my skin. <laughs> it was tough to persuade the tattooist that this was what I really wanted, and he was a little afraid he would have trouble staying within the lines, but in the end, he got interested in the problem. I am virtually covered in tattoos. I teach my lovers to read them, but they are otherwise entirely private, except when I get a sunburn and parts of them show up as pale swirls in the red. And so what you see is, is this imaginative troubling of the memoir and of how we make our histories and, and sort of accenting the notion that as soon as we begin to remember something, as soon as we begin to enter a history, we also enter the realm of fiction. Um, because, as, as we all know, our memories aren't half as clear and precise um, and accurate as we think they are. Um, it was really, I, digression. Um, but I, was, I, I grew up before the whole Ganado, New Jersey axis. It, um, I, I grew up for the first couple of years in Venezuela and um, with my sisters in this jungle compound, long story. But in any case, um, my sisters and I got together just a couple Christmases ago and we started trying to compare stories. Turns out they had a whole different childhood. And, and it, it suddenly really sort of accented that whole notion of, of memoir being something that is, is an amazingly sort of troubled uh, genre. Or we can go up to uh, her mouth, which is, you know, the lips, the place where, where, where sort of, you know, writing comes from. Um, the line of my upper lip is interrupted on the right side by a slight thickening where my grandparents' Dalmatian Essie bit me more than, uh, bit me one of the times she didn't recognize me. Something flared up in her damaged brain now and then, making everything strange. I pictured the room turning white. I was a black, ominous signature, something to flee or bite. I could tell it was coming watching her strange sidle. 
I ran to the bathroom afterwards to see the blood run down into my teeth. Joining my upper lip to my nose is a narrow channel between two well-defined banks. I can fit the tip of my baby finger into the soft ditch. I was proud to point out this feature to my mother, who had never noticed its existence. The little hanging swell at the center of the top lip is so sensitive that I sometimes, when I permit myself, bite and suck and pull at it so devotedly that a bit of skin peels up and dangles loose in my mouth. We've all done this, but none of us ever admitted it before. <laughs> my lower lip is pierced by a labret with a flat head, which looks like a small nail through my lip. The hole is slightly to the right of what my nerves tell me is the center of my lip, and this fraction of a millimeter is enough to make me slightly edgy when I think about it. I pry and tease incessantly at the little shaft, pulling it inward by catching my tongue under the back, bending it over against my lip, and then rotating the shaft around its insertion point like the hand of a clock. Or I catch the little metal disc between my teeth and bite at it carefully. After I had my teeth drilled and had to have a shot of Novocaine, I studied my lips. They were much thicker than I thought, smooth, rubbery slabs that easily got in the way of my teeth. Once I asked for a, a consolatory treat after a trip to the dentist and got a strawberry milkshake. I stabbed myself in the cheek with my straw several times until, with the help of the car mirror, I managed to guide the straw into my mouth. A little later, I felt a funny tickle at my collar and looked into the mirror. A big dribble of pink had flowed all the way down my numb chin and was running down my neck. My lips, I figured out, only worked because they were conscious. Without feeling, I would leap continuously. <laughs> a principle that might hold true, I thought uncomfortably, for other parts of my <laughs> Things I can do with my lips. I can suck in the corners of my mouth hard so the top and bottom lips make two soft beaks, turning my whole head into the body of a fat fish like my mother used to do when I sat on her lap in the rocking chair. Only she could slowly open and close the tiny parrotfish lips, making her eyes big, while my cheeks always pop out of the clamp of my jaws with a little squeak. And so, I mean, what a great way to reimagine the idea of memoir. And also, if you look at the language of this, it's really starting to edge toward the language of poetry. Um, certainly, there's no logic to how these, these you know, paragraphs are flowing. Um, I always think of poetry working in an area of meta-logic that's somewhere beyond logic. And this is, this is working that way associatively. And then, of course, we, we can move through all the little areas of, of her body, thinking back with her, um, or start clicking on the, the links and so on, and, and see where that takes us. But if you look at the design, you know, very simple, very pared down, not, not a lot of bells and whistles and so on. Um, let me take us to uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, there was this guy who had grown up in New Jersey who could put one together as well. Um, he didn't mean to. What was important uh, in his defense is that um, he had begun to write a hard copy novel. You know those things. They come between covers. You've seen them. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I was working on it, um, it was a novel called 1001, it's about um, the 10 minutes and one second before the feature film commences in a movie theater in the Mall of America. And um, because what always has interested me going to films, and you all know this intuitively too, is when you're sitting in the audience before a film, the most interesting thing is the ocean of histories that you're surrounded by, um, the sort of hidden stories, and you look and you go, I wonder what that person is about, you know? Where did she come from? What does she believe? And so I thought, oh, how cool. Okay, so you got, you got like, say, 50 some odd people sitting before a, a film, and what if you saw their stories instead of the film itself? I was working through this, I had met a uh, web designer back in um, the late 90s, and he said, oh, someday we should collaborate on something. And about halfway through this, I realized this was the piece that I wanted to collaborate on, because it had been written in very short little chunks, very Lexia-like, hypertext-like chunks. And, um, and I thought, what I wanted to do was to explore what happens when a, when a written text 
um, you know, a print text becomes a digital text. And one of the things I noticed that was really interesting was um, that if you take something and move it from, from a print text into a digital text, you also move it from essentially a, spa a, a, a temporal manifestation to a spatial manifestation. That is to say that there's only one forward movement in a book, and it's from beginning to end. You know, everything else is slightly devious. Um, and most books are definitely written to, to work in time. Narratives work in time. As soon as you move into the web, as soon as you move into a, a hypertextual space, a hypermedial space, you're actually navigating a kind of space. Um, what's sometimes referred to in theory as liquid architecture is that architecture that sort of works like an Escher drawing. You know, Escher is a guy who, who does these very strange sort of sketches where um, there'll be a whole bunch of staircases and when you begin to follow them, they, they sort of lead around your eyes so that the top of the staircase is really the bottom of the staircase, um, always playing with, with your perspective. And as you begin to move a narrative into the digital realm, you actually begin to move it into a spatial realm that you begin to navigate, not unlike architecture. And the difference between narrative as an art form and architecture as an art form is pretty interesting. Um, Milorad Pavic, who's a, a theorist and, and writer, once made the distinction between reversible and non-reversible art. Um, and he talked about non-reversible art being the kind of art like a piece of music or a novel, let's say by John Grisham, that has to move from beginning to end. It, it's unidirectional, right? And, and as he says, it always moves toward death. It always moves toward the ending. Um, a festive fella. And, and then, um, <laughs> then there's reversible art. And reversible art is, is like architecture or like sculpture that you can approach through different entries and you can approach from different angles. And each angle or door that you walk through or window you look through, you'll see something different through, right? And what's really interesting about that is that um, reversible art has a kind of, of infinite quality to it, infinite mutability to it, or at least you know, tremendously accented mutability. If you think of what happens to narrative as it moves into hyperspace um, or into cyberspace or into, into the digital realm, is that it become, it moves from being a non-reversible art into being a reversible art. And that has profound consequences. So I wanted to explore that. So, so what happened was I, I wrote the novel 1001 and then um, rewrote it, changing certain passages, cutting certain passages, adding certain passages, creating um, uh, links to artificial web pages, faux web pages um, of bands that don't really exist, you know, that kind of stuff, stores in the Mall of America that don't really exist, um, and, and also began to texture over with uh, um, image, sound, that sort of thing. So I want to share it with you. Um, the, what you'll notice, uh, it'll start up in just a second, is we're going to start off with a a uh, read-along. A read-along is just like a sing-along, only you don't actually use your voice, okay? Which is to say you read. I, um, I was looking at the Lumiere quote and, and thinking Bill Gates back in, I think it was 1982 when, when the personal computers were first hitting the, the market, had this great quote about uh, nobody is ever going to need more than 128K for their computer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and films have no use. Um, okay, so anyways, we enter the theater and what you see First of all, is that you can't see what's going on on the screen because that's not what's important. What's going on that's important is what's going on in these characters. And you get to start picking um, characters and beginning to explore who they are 
and, and what they're about. And I'll just read you a couple. We'll, we'll uh, tour a couple of consciousnesses. Um, that's one of the really fun things about fiction. Each art form can do something that other art forms can't do and can't do things that some other art forms can do. And one of the great things that fiction can do that no other art form can do for extended periods of time is to explore other people's consciousness. Um, <coughs> that you actually get to live in somebody else's mind for three days, five days, seven days. Yeah, you, it doesn't work in a painting. Um, and uh, it doesn't work in a, in a piece of music for that kind of extended period of time. So anyway, that's obviously I'm obsessed with that. Um, okay, so mid-afternoon in a movie theater in the Mall of America. Glary lights before the show make everything seem stark and unfinished to Kate Crazy, a bony aerobics instructor bunching her shocking pink ski jacket on the folded up seat beside her and sitting. Kate, blonde hair so dark it is almost the color of high fiber breakfast cereal, is Franz Kafka's great great granddaughter, although she carries no awareness of this within her. Whenever Kate dreams, it is about the plots of Kafka's work, which she has never read because she believes there are already too many stories in the world. <laughs> Kate dreams she is a muscular hare darting through a wet field at night, and that no matter how fast she runs, no matter which direction she chooses, the beautiful hound sleeping within the castle miles away will awaken the next day and chase her down. This is why Kate doesn't sleep unless she has to. This is why she hasn't slept for two nights, why she leans forward now, elbows on knees, concentrating very hard on keeping her blistery brown eyes wide open. Um, and this is the R-rated section, um, and if you notice, it quotes Shelley Jackson's opening sound. Um, okay. Miguel Gonzalez and Angelica Encinas wait neither for the glary lights to dim nor the trailers to flash awake before they get to feel each other up. Fourteen, they have snuck in here. A chant cycles through Miguel's head. Just my hand on her thigh, just there, just like that. Look, just my fingers moving beneath her skirt, just the tips, just the slowness of them, just the heat of her skin, just that and nothing else. Just the way she smells, peppermint shampoo. Just these things, just these and nothing more. Just here, just like this. Just my fingertips moving. Angelica, eyes closed, is far away from Miguel's hand, imagining an establishing shot in her very own private documentary. There, Miguel and Angelica are making out among all these people settling into their seats. And the camera is panning back. And there is the AMC theater. And the camera is panning back, and there is the mall itself, frantic with thousands of other people, frantic with Christmas, with dangling pink angels, with cotton candy snowdrifts. And the camera is panning back and right through the roof, and the parking structures are receding through the gray-white blizzard, and the city park, and the hotels, and the feeble car lights trembling. And it is Sunday, and these touches are as good as any. And so this must be desire. Sure, why not? This must be what they mean when they say that word. And then, of course, there's always something really creepy sitting close by you, you think. Um, <laughs> you're thinking, no, actually, I don't. Um, <laughs> until now. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see if I can find him. No, that's not him. No, that's not him. There he is. Um, <laughs> creepy guy sitting alone. Fastidious Anderson Bates' prematurely gray contract lawyer works out of his split level in Woodbury. To stretch his legs, he sometimes rises from his desk and wanders from room to room in his house, parting the curtains and studying his neighbors' homes for signs they are out. Empty driveways, drawn shades, unclaimed mail. Anderson keeps careful records. Hands in his pockets, he casually strolls over lets himself in, and has a poke around. He wears surgical gloves. He almost never takes anything. If he does, he makes sure it is an object no one will miss, like a handful of AAA batteries from the kitchen drawer full of them. Usually, he just likes to look. Anderson envisions himself an anthropologist interested in how other tribes live. He is especially drawn to bathroom cabinets. The information housed in pill bottles, spray cans, and sacks makes Anderson's head light. On occasion, he likes to touch, 
He enjoys feeling other people's property in his palms, knowing hours later his neighbors will handle the same objects he just handled. He enjoys rearranging things, so his neighbors can't tell whether they have been rearranged or not. He imagines the slight sensation of disorientation his neighbors will experience will do them good. Anderson finds himself speculating about why toenails grow. They accomplish zero in life except the ceaseless increase of protonaceous contamination. But why? <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm not, we're, we're running short on time. I gotta show you at least two more. So I'll, I just uh, wanted to show you this simply because there's a cool film attached. Okay, um, but, but we won't read this because we don't have time. So now we're gonna go um, to a semi read along, which is to say this will be going, it depends how fast my processor is today. Um, either it will get away from me and I will read it twice, or it will move slowly enough and I will be able to read it just once. One, Cynthia Morgenstern wants to love Cary Grant, only in black and white. Conceivably, there are special contact lenses for such a purpose. <laughs> Two, fat is horrifying because it makes you look like a bullfrog version of yourself. Fat reminds Cynthia of something washed up after a storm on a tropical beach. Three, Cynthia wants to dwell in a silent film, sans other actors. Four, Cynthia believes in therapy through television watching. Treasure the angel within you. Remember we all awaken to the brightness of the same sun. Five, recently Cynthia has realized life is probably the thing that arrives in 10 minute portions disturbed by commercials. <laughs> Six, your body is a smaller theater situated inside a bigger theater, situated inside a bigger theater. Theaters are places where outside time and space go away. Cynthia likes theaters. Seven, <coughs> it is dark, <coughs> remain calm. This will all be over soon. <laughs> and on that note, let me switch to something else entirely. Um, okay, so, so we did that. There are other kinds of hypertext. I just want to quickly show you two things that are happening right now and that are just fascinating, sort of leading us into new narrative space. Um, one of them is by a Korean um, author who grew up in France but lived a long time in the U.S., speaks all three languages um, fluently. Um, you know, Vladimir Nabokov, this guy wrote Lolita, he, he used to talk about his childhood saying he was a perfectly normal, trilingual genius. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's something along the same lines with, with um, Young Hai Chang. He has a show going on right now in New York um, and uh, at the New Museum of Contemporary Art. And what he's doing is creating what I think of as sort of film texts. They're, they're the first sh short stories you actually say, not that you've read, but that you've sort of seen. Um, and I just want to play one for you. We'll see how far through we can get. I can guarantee you if I stop early, you're not going to miss anything. Um, it's, a, it's just, it's, it's the experience of, of uh, reading this. And it's called, um, uh, traveling to Utopia. This is the size that is actually shown in New York, by the way. These really great screens. Thank <laughs> you. 
by Logos demanded the same privilege having been born at an earlier date. And a great argument escalated into pushing and shoving and wrestling. During the struggle, chronology would get a death grip on the fluid of logic. Then the conventions of logic would somehow reverse nature. A move that Cronus could only reverse again by allowing Logos to once again slip back on top. That is, that only began to work once Cronus' grip weakened enough to allow this new succession to see that the brothers becoming adults before they were children, before Cronus wrestled them back into children who Logos cast as little adults, spilling them all on all after all. Right. Fighting in every room, upturning furniture, shattering mirrors. Once the influencing machine itself, which had grown dusty on the mantle, was bent irreparably out of shape. For the subjects of the island, the contest was so utterly deadlocked that they eventually forgot what to face the outcome of the Occasionally, a philosopher might stop by to wonder at the commotion or a historian might listen for a while, looking for a way to organize a plot. But even they would shake their heads and walk away after, perhaps dropping a pebble into one of the boxes that someone had set up, so the curious could wager on whichever brother the moment led them to believe would win. And so that's the introduction to a digital novel that actually goes on quite a long way. Um, and I'll, I'll just point out, um, here's the pebble that he was just talking about, and then you get to drop it into which box um, you'd like, and then a story opens up. I, I won't actually um, go through the stories, but if you go to Logos, it opens up into a sort of uh, false mythology of the tribe of Kronos and the tribe of Logos, of the tribe of Tick and the tribe of uh, Tak, um, and that's uh, an area that you read. If you go to uh, Kronos, you get um, another story told to you, and I, I won't actually go through it except to just show you how it works. Um, but you drop that in. You notice how it starts. to open things up to, to questions, um, could you maybe go ahead and turn on the lights and we'll shut, shut this down. Um, you know, there are more questions right now all of us have than any answers about this, but again, I just wanted to go back to this notion of, of what is a book, how does a book function, how is it being transformed right now, what is narrative, how is that functioning, how is that being transformed right now, and what even does reading mean? Uh, anymore. And I think all these things are being redefined. And what's really exciting, if you notice, is the technology is beginning to catch up with the imagination uh, of the writers who are putting these things together. And so the really interesting stuff, you know, we should check back in five years and have the same same discussion and see what's going on. And it also transforms all sorts of stuff about means of production and so on. And obviously you can make one of these for a lot less money than you can uh, um, write and publish a novel, um, and, and you kill fewer trees this way. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So, so it's bringing up a lot of stuff. Um, so let's, let's entertain some of these questions that are, that are haunting you, probably will keep you up tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see anyone doing, using this kind of media like in poetry? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on right now with that. I mean, even the very line, you know, once upon a time there were these two things. They weren't called Cronus and Logos, they were called poetry and prose. And you've heard of them. And, and, and in fact, what's happening is that boundary between poetry 
and prose is beginning to evaporate, certainly in innovative fiction um, right now. So, you know, I don't know if what we just heard and looked at could be classified as prose or, or if we would talk about it as poetry. When I wrote uh, 1001, I, I thought of each of those, well, here's what I did. When I was writing 1001, I always like to influence myself as I'm writing by lots of different voices. I read all the prose poetry I could get my hands on because what prose poetry can do that other forms can't is to sort of condense experience into this, you know, poetry, the word poetry in German is dich, and, and dich comes from this word dichten, which, uh, a verb which means to thicken, and what poetry really does is to thicken language, and, and a lot of hypertext language is a kind of thickened language, a textured language that slows down uh, your reading speed, um, if you noticed. And, and that's part of the fun that, that Young Hai Chang was having, is you want to read it slowly, but you have to read it at his speed, not yours. Um, so yeah, so really interesting stuff's going on right now. Um, there, and if, if you're interested in poetry, there's, besides that URL I gave you, which has some poetry works on it, what we would think of as poetry works, um, there's also a publishing company of uh, digital technology called Eastgate Systems, and they just brought out something maybe a year and a half or two ago called Captain My Captain, which is a poem that starts off solid on the page, and then parts of it start melting away, other parts start getting overwritten on it, and, and it's sort of language coming alive on, on the page. Um, so, that, so that's what's going on. Um, yeah? Uh, what about your childhood growing up in Venezuela? Oh, it's really interesting. My dad went down there. He was in the oil business. And um, I don't know if you, some of you are familiar with the map of Venezuela. There's this really big lake called Maracaibo. And uh, that is where we were living. And, and we were in this jungle compound, which was a really strange place to grow up. I, my first memories, for instance, are of my mom. Uh, was doing the laundry one day, and she clearly just like left some sheets on the floor, and this really big snake that crawled into the sheets, and she just kind of scooped them all up, threw them in the wash, wash them, oh. and she put up. And, and my recollection is like, you know, what is your earliest memory, and tell me how that influences you. <laughs> is, is, is her lifting the sheet, and this like five foot snake dropping out, and the sheet as it was drowning, obviously the snake had bitten into the sheet, and they were all the poison stains. And, and that was pretty much my child. <laughs> and so, you know, are, are you familiar with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a guy who wrote 100 Years of Solitude, if not go after you tonight? It's, it's, it's this amazing book. And, and it's, you know, known as working the genre of magical realism. And one of the things that you learn very early in growing up in Venezuela is that it's all sort of magical realism. I mean, it's just, it was an amazing sort of surreal world. So I come back to New Jersey of all places, which is, which is it, 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 it's the state of the, the, the climate controlled mall, right? And, and so I go, I'm going into school and we have show and tell. And so I'm bringing in blow guns and I'm bringing in machetes. And um, nobody believes me. And literally, okay, this literally happens. So I, I keep getting sent like, like every third week to the principal's office. Um, you're lying. And then I go, no, call my mom up. It really happened. And, and then they'll, okay. So the whole, you know, edge of, of fiction and nonfiction is very blurry for me. And that, that, that whole section in Shelley Jackson's hypertext, A Memoir of Lies, um, feels very right to me, that, that notion. And then, okay, so you have that childhood, and then you get together with your sisters and try to recall it, and they like all remember, no, that was me with this name. Um, and you just realize that, that you know, one's identity isn't as stable as one would like to believe over time. And that's, of course, obsessed me, um, that, you know, in, in my works. Um, and the notion of reality, you know, just seems grossly overrated to me. So I'm, I'm always sort of wondering in the strange areas. Um, yes, that's a, that's a really good, good question. Um, yeah, if we Googled this Young Hai Chang, would we be able to see that book that you showed us part of? Yes, and a whole bunch of other stuff too. I highly recommend, that's called Traveling to Utopia, and there's another one on that list that's called Busting Down the Door, which is also really, really um, good. And you know, this is one of the things that the web has allowed us, is to gain access to these spaces um, for nothing. So you like, don't I have to pay or something? And it's like, no, that's fine. They just want their work out here. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we're looking at these things, and I'm sure you're, you're all fascinated. We're used to watching things on TV and movies and surfing. And in terms of the future of the book, yeah. what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the students here, I mean, you, I mean, you can imagine sitting down with your Charles Dickens novel versus, you know, <laughs> traveling with Tom, Tom Asula through a story or stories. You have agency. You can make decisions in there where you want to go. It's not the same novel for everyone. Is the book going to be dead in 25 years if we keep following this it's, path? You know, and that, I mean, that's the question I think we all have right now. And, okay, here's the story I would have told you had, had we come across this question 10 years ago. I would have said that within 25 years, the book would be dead, primarily for economic reasons. It costs a lot of money to print books. And, um, uh, you know, all a book is is a virtual reality machine that's, you know, relatively inexpensive <coughs> that um, delivers a lot of information. It's a delivery, you know, uh, uh, an information delivery system in a lot of ways and, and nothing more. It's just it's a really effective one. And all of us who have been raised with books have, have a very sort of special relationship to them. We like the smell, <laughs> the texture. There are things that you can do with books that you can't do with computers, like curl up in your bathtub or in your bed <laughs> and all. But those days are also changing. You know, the computer is shrinking right now, and there's stuff on the market now, you know, digital readers that are roughly the size of books, and in no more than five years, they'll look exactly like books. You want a leather cover on it, you want to open it up, it's backlit, so it's a lot easier on your eyes. Um, it doesn't have like hideous glare that gives us all headaches after we've surfed the web for a long time. So on the one hand, that's true, but I think on the other hand, um, the story I would tell you now is that what seems to be happening isn't that the technology is replacing the book, but rather starting to go on its own sort of journey. And that what's going to happen is that the book, in some form, it just isn't going to be hardback, um, but you know, trade paperback or, or even cheaper forms um, will continue to thrive because people just love them. But at the same time, there's going to be this new art form, essentially, developing that isn't supplanting the book, but, but is sort of complementing it or expanding what it is we mean when we say we read. And I think a lot of the, the sort of intuitive um, reticence that we feel before reading in this way is going to start dissolving as the computer shrinks down into something that feels like a book. Um, and also read by a generation that's grown up on computers. You know that, that two things, if, if you ever need somebody to fix a computer, you always look for somebody younger than 13. And, and the other thing is that technology is always defined as a thing that was invented after you were born. So, so <laughs> you know, in fact, writing is a technology, right? And it's, it's a mediating system. Um, so it's just one that we're more familiar with than, than others. Yeah? What do you think libraries well, you know what? Stanford came into a whole bunch of bucks like Stanford didn't have enough. And, <laughs> and, and what it did um, was it, it was time to rebuild its <coughs> library, and it decided to become one of the first libraries in the United States that um, doesn't have any books in it. And what it uh, did was to create a highly evolved digital library and team up with Google. Have you been following this in the news? And Google's project is to put every book in the world, not just the Library of Congress, um, on the web so that you can gain access to it. And, and there's still like legal debates on whether, for instance, um, you'll need to pay to get into the library or whether it'll all be open for you. But if you go to Google now, there's something, I can't remember what it's called, it's Google Books or something, Google Scholar or something like that. And, and basically, there are a whole bunch of books. <laughs> Somebody, for instance, put 1001 on the, the print copy, um, and there's no like copyright violation. And, um, and you could just go and either print the books off or read them online. And at first, again, that sounds like, well, but I want to curl up with my book. But if you think about the, the general <coughs> population of the world, most people don't have access to such a complete library. And what you're doing is making <coughs> information available to people who would never have had that kind of information available. And suddenly, every library in the world becomes as good as Stanford's library. And, and so the question of library, I think, is going to become, you know, is a library a building or is a library a space that houses information? If it's the latter, 
then we <coughs> may not need libraries, or, or the libraries will be completely redefined as, as information systems, you know? Yeah. This makes me wonder about the evolution of the human brain, if there's been any investigation into this. There's a certain tactile, <coughs> sensual pleasure in reading a book. Yes. And we're sitting here reading a book, zoom, 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 on the screen. What yep. is that doing in our heads? And wonder how that's going to look. And it's good, you know, it's, it's really, that's why I said, you know, to bring up that notion of what, what does it even mean to read. And he's doing the zoom, zoom, zoom stuff um, for a reason, and, and that reason is to actually foreground how much data really does come into our, you know, heads every day. Okay. Wait a second, that's not my brain. And, and, and I, I think it's, it's very much that sort of relationship. But what I would argue, I think what some of these guys would argue, is that they're not trying to duplicate the experience of reading textbooks, um, you know, printed books, because I think that experience can't be duplicated. I mean, there's something very special about that. But that they're trying to create a new relationship with text that involves a kind of multi-dimensional engagement with the art. So I, I don't. When you really look at something, for instance, like the Steve Thomas Sula piece, which was the last one we saw, it wasn't so much that the images were functioning as the way images would in a movie, which is to say to try to recapitulate the text, but rather they were trying to widen the text in certain ways or to suggest certain ways of reading that sort of thing. Or, or the Chang piece actually began to turn words into images. I think that's one of the reasons we were so sort of anxious about it, uh, looking at it, because it wasn't coming to us the way words usually come. And, and you know, so, so I think it's, there's something to be said about it adding something, something to be said about it taking away something, and something to be said about, again, these being two different art forms, rather than trying to think of them as competitive. Should we, let, yeah, one more, uh, or any, one more, two oh. more. Questions. Okay. And we're, we're no more than five. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a couple more questions. And uh, maybe the student in the back. Okay. And then, um, and then you. Then sure. You. Earlier you said that uh, you thought that in 25 years all the books would be gone. But wouldn't it be smarter to keep books around? Because I mean, back at the millennium, we had the scare of we thought everything electronic yeah. would break down and stuff. So if we put all books on computers and then everything electronic would just kind of broke down or crashed or whatever. We wouldn't have anything to read, so don't you think it'd be smart if we kept the books? Uh, <laughs> maybe one or two. No, that's what it's <laughs> actually a great idea. You bring it up a really good question. Yeah, I also noticed what happened. Remember, I told you there's this really great um, hypertext that came out in 1986 called Afternoon a Story. Technology has already so far surpassed. Um, the disc, it came out on a disc, not, not a CD, that you can't play that anymore. Um, one of the jokes with technology is that actually it outpaces itself much, much faster than books. Uh, John Barth, in fact, a wonderful um, experimental writer, just wrote, uh, not just, a couple of years ago, wrote an essay in which he pointed out that the decomposition rate of electronic media is much, much faster than print media. Um, and so, absolutely, we all need to keep our, uh, at least one copy. Yeah. With books being on the web like that, yeah. shows, how does an author read the world? Well, um, oftentimes not. Um, and and what, I mean, that's, I can only sort of touch on this because we need to, to wrap up, but what you've opened up is, is the legal issues involved in um, printing on the web. The pros of printing on the web is that um, anything that you print could be read by millions and millions of people. Um, so you're, you're able to disseminate your work potentially much, much wider. The problem with printing on, or, or publishing anything on the web is that anybody um, can use it and not pay you for it. And, um, and the question, it's very much like, like the whole you know, Napster phenomenon a couple of years ago. It's, it's like, do you pay for your music? Or do you download it? Well, you download it because it's fun, it's free, you want it, you're young, you don't have a lot of money, um, and as a result, you're robbing the artist who created the music. Um, and, and you know, how does that, that work? It's a, it's a very interesting sort of question, but there's, there's no answer. And right now, that's actually like an illegal limbo. Um, people are working on it, and nobody quite knows how to deal with it. Yeah. OK, I uh, want to wrap up now. I just want to point out, uh, first of all, that uh, Dr. Olson, thank you again for, for coming thank out you. here. Thank you. As part of the, the FCT 
to arrangement. I have it all signed and, and delivered. Dr. Olson will be visiting us in the summers and uh, offering a course here for you guys. So if you're interested in, in continuing this discussion, I hope you consider some plug for enrollments. And all that. <laughs> Remember, I'm saying this, I'm practical. You might want to consider following up. I think like an electronic literature class is very exciting. Uh, also, there are copies of Beach's Kisses out there uh, for, for signing if you'd like to purchase them. Again, thank you so much for coming, Lance. Thank you, and thanks for the great work.